storytelling as a mobilizing tool for direct action. Uh, so we'll start in just a minute um, and sit back and, and thanks for coming. stories. The moon is greater than the sun, she would say. But how can that be? I would say, the sun is what gives all of earth its light and its life. Yes, she would respond. But it's at night that we need the light. It is in the darkness that seeds grow. They germinate in the dark and from the mud and muck emerge to change the story of our day. And now, as always, the story of the world is being rewritten from the flash floods in the drying riverbeds to the cracks forming in Antarctica and in the rolling waves of the rising seas, the story of our world is changing. Perhaps that's what my grandmother was trying to tell me, that the more impossible the situation that the more improbable the odds, the better the story. At this time of a global climate crisis, of our entire living sacred ecosystem on the brink of collapse, perhaps we are just preparing to write the best story ever told. Or perhaps we will write the last story ever told. Let us begin. History awaits us. An unremarkable brown bird with a beautiful song alighted in the knotted crest of a tree and sang to welcome the return of the sun. I awoke slowly and to the sound of birds. They were not the birds I was used to. I was far from home. Around me, other people were stirring, whispering inside the thin walls of their tents. It had been a cold night. Beyond a thin path through the trees, the camp was awaking and preparing to, for what the days would hold. Long lines of waking dreamers flowed through long tables lined with teas and porridge. The camp was massive. Volunteer teams chopped carrots, emptied compost toilets, uh, filled water tanks, and scrubbed dishes and kept watch along the perimeter. We saw all of this happen. For, there was no backstage crew. There was no curtain to hide behind. There's not even a stage, but the ground itself. We were all on the same plane. This was Ennegelende, a direct action camp that for the second year in a row had perched itself on the edge of a coal mine. The theory behind the action was that if we want to maintain a planet compatible with life on Earth, it means keeping the carbon under the ground and out of our atmosphere. The morning plenary had started, and the information of the day was calmly reported. A woman pushed her glasses up her nose and spoke to the heart of matters, the thing that had brought all of us here, the action consensus. <clears throat> all actions have been designed around this action consensus, most no notably that we, as Ennegelende, are non-violent. We do not intend to hurt anyone and we will not participate in property destruction. These are the agreements that have been made through a consensus organizing process. If you do not agree with these principles and you wish to par take part in actions that do not follow these guidelines, that is fine. That is your decision. But we ask for you to do this outside of Ennegelende. The time to discuss this action consensus is over for it has already been adopted by consensus. It's the time to pass to action. The crowd startled itself with the sound of its applause. We were many. Actions would begin at noon. I'd come a long way to be there. 
across the snows of the Pyrenees Mountains and the wide Rhone and Seine, over the great plains of the Rhineland and through the tall forests of Lusatia. But I had come alone. The nervousness reminded me of my first direct action. I had been at this eco-festival, and a woman with a giant bird puppet passed me a flyer. I read it perhaps a dozen times, but I couldn't find anyone to go with me, so I wouldn't go. I tried to ignore it, but it was burning a hole in my pocket. I called into work, said I wasn't feeling well, and caught, caught the first bus of the morning. I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but when I arrived, I was welcomed, and my whole life changed. But now again, I'd come alone to an action. When, from across the camp, I saw my dear friend Flo, a Hungarian graffiti artist, fresh off the overnight bus from Budapest. We became buddies and set off to find our own affinity group. But how does one find a group of like-minded individuals who wish to take part in actions with the same level of risk as you do? Well, speed dating, obviously. <laughs> The camp had organized a mass speed day. A labyrinth had been drawn on, on the ground, and at each intersection was a different question. You chose one path or the other based on your response. Are you willing to risk arrest? Yeah. Do you run fast? Yeah. yeah. Have you ever done this sort of thing before? Yeah. Do you like to be at the front of actions? No. <laughs> and so on, and so on, until... Oh, hi. Uh, I'm Kevin. Are, are, are you all looking for an infinity group too? Yeah, I mean, there's kind of a lot of us, but if, if you want, we can... I mean, if you, it maybe... Do you want to be my infinity group? Just till the end of the story. Yeah? Yeah. yeah? Cool. We were a mixture of characters. Two Italians, a boat builder and a chemist. Two French curators, a woodworker and a cook. We spoke a chopped soup of languages and made a point of getting to know each other better. Our, our experiences and our fears, our levels of comfort. We made a group name. Cuba! <laughs> Something we could call in a crowd to find each other. And we made a hand signal to hold up to see each other above the crowd. That way, if I lose you during the actions, I'll be able to find you. And if you lose me, you'll be able to find me. Should we practice? So, if any time you hear me say Cuba and do this, you do the same, okay? Let's try it. Cuba! Cuba. Perfect. <laughs> this simple trick will keep us together through the confusion of the actions. This is the Anthropocene. Anything can happen. Expect the unexpected. The collapse will be anything but boring. With the affinity groups came grounding. And now the decision was taken in groups. The information was shared. The confusion shifted to mystery. And all we could do was embrace the mystery and prepare for it as best we could. We joined in action training in the field behind the camp. The Germans had borrowed a tactic from the anti-nuclear movement. Instead of two lines with police and one with protesters marching at each other towards some inevitable confrontation, by organizing ourselves into fingers, we were able to get through police lines by rushing towards the police instead of away in small groups. After all, the goal was to get into the mine, not to fight cops. The beauty of Endegelende is its scalable structure. Everyone had a buddy. Four or six buddy pairs formed an affinity group. Five or so affinity groups formed a block. Dozens of blocks came together to form fingers, which could be hundreds or even thousands of people. Altogether, we were ending and ending. At mid-morning, we saw the green finger depart. 300 people with large backpacks slipped out of camp and towards some unknown location. Soon after, the half-hour call for the blue finger was announced. Groups began to gather around the blue flag that had been raised at one corner of camp. It was time for the final preparations. 
We wrote the legal phone number on our arms. If everything else was taken away from us, we would still have our bodies, this number, and we would not be alone. Flo made as, as many sandwiches as we could carry, and I went to get the white suits that had come to find the action. There was thin pieces of fabric, crudely sewn, but it was also an identity. It, like any mask, transformed me. And as I put it on, I dissolved into the collective. And I joined the sea of white suits. The drums began to beat. And the crowd began to move, swelling like water overflowing its container. We all knew that from here on, the day would unfurl into a linked chain of events, unstoppable once begun. After we left the camp, there was no turning back. Our safety was in our numbers. We had to stay together. As such, we were all impacted by our collective decisions, so we'd make them together. This is the responsibility of freedom. Our sea of white shapes set out, swelling and thinning into lines to walk the narrow paths to the tall forest. Next to us, a thin line of ants carried out their eternal shared work, each carrying small pieces of an endless puzzle. I found myself looking everywhere at once, eyes on the edges, watching for police. They could be anywhere, expect the unexpected. But as I was watching, I was also being watched. The forest was watching them. The messenger birds had flown to tell the others that the humans were amassing to join them. The trees gossiped through their roots. The word had spread, and from the hollows of the forest, everywhere eyes peered. The forest had not seen such a large pack of humans in as long as any of the trees had remembered. The stones, though, the stones told them the old stories, as stones do. Even the wolves, which nobody even believed were still there, watched from the high ground. Many of the wolves were skeptical having lost faith in the humans long ago. But this seems different, one of them said. Their hearts are again light like the sun. The trees had heard that this forest would be the next to be destroyed, that the insatiable metal monsters were advancing and would rip up every tree, every blade of grass, every piece of life the forest had. It would turn everything to dust with their machines. Unless we could stop them. It's true, whispered a hawk. It's only the humans who can stop their own machines. The illness is the medicine it seeks. She pulled higher into the breeze, and from that great height, she looked down to where the forest fell away to the dust of the mine. She remembered the forest and villages that had been there. They still spoke to her from the places where once they had been. She would help them if she could. We came to the edge of our world. What had been a forest in 14 towns was nothing now. Nothing more than piles of dust that stretched to the horizon in all directions. What had started as a single shovel in the earth a tiny hole to take a single piece of coal was spreading and pushed out to the south and the west, growing endlessly, for the machines were mindless alchemists who reduced everything to fine powder, like capitalists that reduced all things to coins and paper. The machines would continue until there was nothing left, or they would be stopped. The first of the machines lay like a great gate above us, each affinity group crossed that threshold, throwing ourselves into the emptiness of the future to fill it. The herd broke across the dust plains, and we flowed down into the valley of the stampede. Almost a thousand of us rushed forth. Anything would happen. Expect the unexpected. The collapse will be anything but boring. 
We took the first machine. The security guards were outnumbered 100 to 1. As we joyous rebels climbed all over what had been designed as a tool for destruction, we filled its bridges and towers like, like white blood cells upon a fit sickness with its circular spiral stairs and, and trampoline conveyor belts. It felt more like a playground than a weapon. I climbed up the steep ladder stairs to the top of the creature's tail and stared out into the dusk. It would be thousands of years before a seed could grow here again. of eco-feminist, queer, and trans groups dance to the sound of marching band. They weren't waiting for the radically different world they wanted. They were creating it. They danced with, with garlands of flowers in their hair and a deep joy crept into the space that should have been underground. A woman with a megaphone came around and announced a delegates council. Clemence agreed to represent our affinity group. This delegates council gathered around a single question. What should we do now? Any proposals? Yeah, one, two, uh, three, yeah, one, okay. Stay here and guard the machines. Thank you. Two. Go to the power station at the edge of the mine. Yeah, or three. Break action consensus and engage in light sabotage, removing stones from beneath the railroad tracks. That brings the, tr the coal from the mine to the power station. Uh, Clemence returned to our affinity group and repeated the proposals. We did a temperature check to see how we felt about each proposal. Now, a temperature check, if you've never done one, is this kind of weird, non-spoken way of gauging the opinion of a crowd. Uh, people wiggle their fingers at different heights to show their support or worry for a group. Hands high, say, yeah, yeah, I like this. Hands low, no, I don't, I'm not into this. So, affinity group, this is us. W what should we do? Should we do a temperature check on each proposal and see how we feel? Okay. Should we, one, guard the machines? Let's see, how do people feel? Yeah, okay. Two, go to the power plant? Okay. Or three, sabotage? Okay. After a long conversation process where we all came to an agreement, <laughs> we came to an agreement. We would go to the power station. 400 would stay, 600 to the power station, and 100 would sabotage. Our group will leave in 20 minutes. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, damas et caballeros, and everyone in between, as such began the March of Fools. <laughs> no one had scouted the route, because this had not been planned. But there is one great advantage of unpredictable decisions is that not even the police can plan for them. 600 white suits set out, the groups held together. We need to move quicker than the police to get in. We streamed through the pine forest and spread out. A pine tree heard us coming and threw herself over a fence, pulling it down, and we stepped easily over and onto the road. Only two police cars were there. But we were sure more would come, and they would come quickly. A last fence was pulled down by many hands working together. It fell like a red carpet unfurling. We marched over, and we were in. We had been quick, a step 30 minutes after the decision had been called, we were in. Suddenly we all realized the scale of what was around us. The immense cooling towers beckoned above us, 
pumping out clouds as if humans had decided to remake the sky. Huge windowless rectangles rose above us on both sides. Transistors buzzed above our heads. It was in that moment that we realized we were in. We had succeeded in entering a place that none of us had ever seen before. This was the center of a centralized energy structure. We were so close to its heart. This was also the moment that we realized our plan of entering the power station was not actually a plan, but a destination. We hadn't planned for success. We didn't think we'd get in. Now, surprised by the unlikely experience of actually being inside such a place, we all realized we had no idea what to do. <laughs> the general plan seemed to be to find a, the mythic big red button, and if you only press it, it would shut down the entire thing. Hoops went casually about, looking for any way in. Meanwhile, more and more police arrived in the dark armies, predictably too harsh, and spooked the crowd like wolves scare, scare a flock of sheep. Having gotten in, the next objective was to get out as quickly as possible. Flo was pulled away from me by a policeman. Cuba! Cuba! I joined the French curators, locking arms and deciding together with our many eyes. The, the thug squad was multiplying and armed to the teeth. The rise of tear gas was defining the horizon. If the police strategy had been to create chaos and confusion, it, it worked. The police were possessed by a fury of violence. They were, their dark bodies ran swinging their clubs like ravenous dogs swinging their clubs indiscriminately, hitting people, punching them all and stop, 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 stop. Have you ever, ever had one of those moments when you look at yourself and you think, what the hell am I doing? This was May. I live in Barcelona. I could have been on a beach. But instead, I was voluntarily inside a German power station, <laughs> surrounded by riot police. I mean, I was never the kind of kid that liked violence. I didn't even like sports. I never imagined myself doing something like this. This was never part of the plan. As a kid, I wanted to be an environmentalist. I thought that meant petri dishes and test tubes and looking at the world through the comfort of a microscope. But this isn't that world we live in anymore. Have you seen the news? Glaciers the size of Delaware are already falling into the seas. Drought is already stirring up tribal wars in the east of Africa. And methane is already escaping from beneath the Arctic tundra. We are living in the tipping point. Right fucking now. This isn't just an environmental problem, this is a justice problem. It is the people and the ecosystems who have done the least to provoke this crisis, who are the most vulnerable and already receiving the worst impacts. Whatever issue moves you, whatever struggle you are in, whatever you hold dear, climate change threatens that. This isn't that same world we grew up in. This isn't that same story. What is at stake is so big, so huge, I guess I didn't know what to do. So I started doing everything I could. And I meant this, I'm not on a beach. I'm here, inside a German power station, and I know exactly why. People, Blinded by the pepper spray, lurched around trying to get out like proud wild animals caught in a thin plastic net. Strangers found them and flushed their eyes until they could see enough to run again. It was confusing as hell, but we were not lost. Our map was our comrades spinning around us. I saw our C-shaped hand signal above the crowd, then saw Flo. We grabbed each other's hands and did not let go until we were out. Now, the police lines were closing in. The shrinking darkness of their armored suits approaching. Flow through, the crowd was saying. Flow through. And now the herd came together. Our defense was in our numbers and we stuck together. This is what we had practiced. We dissolved back into our pairs and our herd picked up speed and we rushed the thugs. The tide had turned. 
Flo and I gripped hands and blinded ran, following the white suits ahead of us and avoiding the darkness that was trying to capture us. We came nimble from all sides and through. But 14 kilometers away on the loading dock, Beth saw a single puff of smoke arise from one of the cooling towers, then nothing. The blockades were working. Vattenfall had to reduce the plant's capacity to 20% to, to avoid a complete shutdown. This is what we dreamt of. Seeing only the blue sky and not the steam that Vattenfall decided to burn up into it. But, but not all of us had escaped. About a hundred people had been caught and stood surrounded by police. They would stay there for another eight hours. But they were together. They would laugh and sing and dance. They taunted the police with flattery. Okay, repeat after me. You're sexy. You're sexy. Oh, louder, louder. You're sexy. You're sexy. You're cute. You're cute. Take off your riot suit. Take off your riot suit. You're sexy. You're sexy. You're cute. You're cute. Take off your riot suit. It disarmed them more than taking away their weapons. <laughs> but from here on began a ritual dance where both sides knew their roles. Nobody brought identification. It clogged the legal processes. And eventually, everyone was released without charge. They trickled back to camp, like Achilles from the underworld, a golden bow in each eye. And at camp, a hero's welcome awaited, and we dance as all heroes must dance at the end of stories. Our joy kicked the dust into the sky. It formed new constellations. It is in the darkness where seeds grow, like the seeds of a new forest that will come to fill the emptiness left behind by the mines and the machines. Heroes appear when they know they are needed. We are living in the tipping point of history, of a moment of desperate beauty with our entire sacred global ecosystem on the brink of collapse. It is time for everyone to awake the hero that sleeps inside of you, to summon the ancestor that you will one day become. If a law is unjust, the only justice is to break that law until all unjust laws bend on history's long arc towards justice. And last weekend, it happened again. Thousands of people went into the mine again as they will again. And I'll be back. But I'm going to need an affinity group. Will, will you come? Will you join me in writing the next chapter of this story? I, I know disobedience is a privilege that not everyone has. But if you have that privilege, it is an obligation in the Anthropocene. If you only have your body, and you place it between two great pieces of destruction, if you can fill that space with so much love that there are hundreds of you, thousands of you, one day, there won't be enough police to drag us all away. And one day, I'll tell my granddaughter, the moon is greater than the sun. But how can that be, she'll ask. The sun is what gives all of Earth its light and its life. Yes, I will say. But it is at night that we need the light. Expect the unexpected. The collapse will be anything but boring. Thank you. Thank you.
said this is an experiment in how we can be telling stories of our own personal transformation as ways of inviting other people into the processes of collective transformation. I was so moved by Melinda that I made a whole show about it, and I've ne never made a show before. Um, and I think this is, a, this is a simple trick that people can do of just, uh, you know, we use a lot of science and figures and things, but really if you talk about, if you talk from your place of passion, that's contagious. Um, and I think as we can understand activism as, it's not about, it's not just about the media and just about the photo. It's about creating collective spaces of transformation uh, so that you go in and you come out different and then everyone you tell about, that story spreads. Uh, so we're really lucky that there's such good organizers that organize such beautiful things as ending the so I'll see you guys in a bit. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. Um, and anyone who's interested in creative activism, uh, we're going to have an art space set up all during the COP, so for the next two weeks, basically, until the 18th. It's at 99 uh, Dorothea Strasse. Um, if I didn't pronounce that right, I can come and give you the address. And we're there every day from 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, and it's a creative space to prepare actions. Um, and uh, we're trying to build a queer feminist block looking to the march on Saturday. Um, and because a lot of the internationals from the COP are coming in to, to, to work on actions there. So come on by and you can learn how to make a stencil or you can help some other people make some, something for them or, or we can help you with your actions. So 99 Dorothy, Dorothy in Strasse, uh, 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. every day. Cool. See you there.